Welcome to the Hyatt Regency tent uh, for the second annual New Orleans Book Festival at Tulane. My name is Tim Francis, and I'm on the Board of Administrators at Tulane University and also a Tulane Law grad. This is exciting. I didn't know this many people read books, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, there's, there are like people everywhere, and it, you guys have read books. Well, we have two uh, fabulous panelists today. We all have something in common, connections to New Orleans. Sarah Brooms from New Orleans, and Imani Perry's mother worked at Xavier University, along with my father, Norman Francis. Um, and that's the only connection we have, because they're a lot smarter than I'll ever be. <laughs> so l let me begin by um, saying a couple notes about our panelists. Um, both are New York Times bestsellers. Uh, Sarah Broom, uh, her first book, The Yellow House, received the 2019 uh, National Book Award for nonfiction. <laughs> Amani Perry is a professor of African American Studies at Princeton and received the 2022 National Book Award for Nonfiction for South to America. <laughs> and you've heard enough from me. Please welcome our panelists. Good afternoon, friend. Good afternoon, cousin. <laughs> cousin. Yes, before we actually um, met in person, we claimed each other. We did. Yes. And we usually coordinate outfits, but now my shirt and your lipstick match, and so that's our coordination Somehow, for the day. Spiritually. Yes, spiritually. Through essence. So the last time we were together mm. was in Princeton. We had a conversation similar sure, to this one. Sure. And you recently returned to Princeton, New Jersey for a particular reason, which I think should initiate our conversation. I think, I think so. The, you know, we were told that we were here together because we both won the National Book Awards, mm -hmm. but we know that we're here because of more than that, right? Absolutely. So, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison. The archive. Yeah. Um, there's this life-changing exhibit at Princeton. Mm -hmm. Uh, called Sites of Memory. Yes, curated by my colleague Autumn Womack, brilliant professor of English at Princeton. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in the middle of just existential wandering, which is what I feel like I'm doing and working on my next book, yeah. I thought I'd take a pilgrimage to visit Toni Morrison's archives. And, and it actually was that for me. Yeah. It was a sensual experience. Mm -hmm. It was a mapped experience. It was one of the greatest uh, exhibits I think I've ever seen. I would agree. And so we're going to talk a little bit about we'll that. Talk a little bit about, and about yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I would love to hear what stood out for you. I will say for me, <clears throat> part of what I feel is. is a piece of my life calling is I'm really interested, well, two parts. One is the black woman artist mm. who is recognized as genius, right? Mm -hmm. um, and often described as sort of coming to the earth fully formed as genius, right? Mm. And so, and the labor is to a certain extent completely mystified or made invisible, mm -hmm. which then also means it's the labor, but it's also, but it's the steps and it is the adversity in the process, mm -hmm. right, the roadblocks. But then there's this other piece, which is that as far as I have, and I'd love to know what you thought, every, every black woman artist who is extraordinary I know of is also an intellectual, was also an intellectual. Morrison is an extraordinary intellectual. Mm -hmm. And what I think this exhibition shows is that she's, fully, she's a woman fully, and also a deep, deep thinker, mm. an organizer of materials and ideas to, in order to produce sure. art. Sure, Yeah. I mean, this was, I think, for me, very much akin to seeing maybe the way that a painter might work. Yeah. 
because of course we see the book and it's this finished miraculous seeming thing certainly for me as the person who made it i go what how did that happen right right um but in this exhibit we get to see all the layers the different colors the different striations the strokes underneath the work yeah and we get to see the way she in a way paints over her beginnings uh, to make something else. And also this, you and I were talking about the myth of originality. Yeah. The idea that somehow we put all this pressure on ourselves by pretending to be original. Yes. But I think in, in that, in her archives, in her papers, in the way she sort of constituted herself, yeah. we see all the way she is repetitious. We see all the way she's looking elsewhere for ideas, mm -hmm. for inspiration, for culling. Mm -hmm. um, it's what she calls what literary archaeology. Yeah, it's not a gorgeous term. And she and there's this there's this interview that she gave, I don't know, in the early '90s, in which she said, "I I, I stick to cliches, and it's just and then make and she did she sticks to cliches." and then defamiliarizes them. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually see the process mm -hmm. of that defamiliarization. That's true. That's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. But that what you just said about the um, mapping also, it's taking me back to a conversation that we had, I don't know, like two or three years ago about the visual artist Julie Moretu. Yes. And we were talking, who's just extraordinary if you ever, and she has these layered maps of mm -hmm. some of her work, but we were talking about there was a painting that she that went to someplace like the Met, and then she was like, it's not done, give it back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which they were very, <laughs> they were on that. But that that process of like, that you are, um, that you're constantly making. So, what did it give you in terms of, what did those kinds of sort of the painterly, the process, what does that give you as you're working now? Does that, did it feel immediately relevant to your process now? <clears throat> I think it, it was a reminder that I should just let myself be wild. Yeah. That, that th there is a moment to be wild and then a moment to be very composed. Mm -hmm. and, and that in the work, we can allow for a certain amount of wildness. You know, it's funny because I've been thinking a lot lately about I feel like I'm talking about art incessantly, painting. You talk but, about but art a lot. I, I do talk about, I, Which because is it's wonderful. the thing that I'm drawn yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, the painter Jimmy Lee Suttoth yes. uh, from Alabama actually mm -hmm. said, always said, you know, when I die, my brushes go with me, because he painted often with his fingers. And, um, mm. and, and I just think that exhibit or seeing this sort of wildness of Morrison helped me think about just not putting so much pressure on the process, letting the process sort of unfold in the way that it feels like unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the rarity of walking in and seeing a black woman's things collected. Yeah. Did it make you wanna um, save differently? Did well, it make, I, do you I think already saved too much, girl. Okay, all right. What about you? I, I wonder about you and your own process, having written so many books now. What, yeah. How do you sort of position yourself in relation to all of these maps you've made for each particular work? So, it's wonderful that you asked. I'm about to make a, a um, terrible confession, but because I save too much, and I love the word you used earlier, culling. So I had over a million emails a month ago. I had over a million email messages. <laughs> I'm serious, this is not an exaggeration, I'm not being hyperbolic. And I now have on the order of 20,000. Wow. And in that process, I've made these decisions about what needs to be kept from each. And I email myself ideas constantly. I email myself paragraphs. I might take, not take them up again for 15 years, concepts. And so now I have a disciplined <laughs> collection of what I think were the important thoughts along the way. This is, for me, was part of the sort of this journey of my year of being 50 years old is about, like, is about culling and 
trying to decide, okay, what do I take with me if God willing I have another 50 years? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I'm trying to now be a little bit more deliberate and, and, and the less sort of worried about what I might not, what I might forget, you know, what I might not keep. And I've also been thinking just about like, you know, the detritus we live with because in a digital, it's so easy to keep everything, right? And then you can't, it's like yeah. Benini's paradox. It's like if you have a map with everything, with everything on it, it's not useful. Oh, interesting. Right, you can't actually use a map with everything. I mean, so much of what makes the, the experience of encountering the mm -hmm. things someone has left behind is the absence of thought about it, right? I mean, if you think about um, Linnell George's book okay. about Octavia Butler. Yeah. It couldn't exist if Butler was like, this is embarrassing, or this is a grocery store list, or this is a packing list. Th there was some abandon. Yeah, in the process. In the process. Yeah. And that, I think, is about a, a certain degree of internal feeling. You were talking about being an intellectual. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's part of it is that there is a kind of freedom you have to have, right? To know that whatever exists is beyond you. Right, and be, being willing to abandon things. Mm -hmm. But see, and that's it. Well, here's the thing, though, that I've been thinking about that is sort of, in some ways, another dimension of that is so part of what you see when you move through, and you can see portions of, <laughs> of this exhibition that we're talking about online. Um, the part of what you see when you move through it is that, that many of the pages are burned because mm -hmm. Morrison has had a house fire. And I was thinking about, I think for both of us, so much of what we meditate on is loss. Mm. And the sort of, whether it's, you know, I mean, all kinds of loss, but the materials loss and sort of, and these are, when you see the edges of the pages burned, you know there were lots of pages that, were, that didn't make it. And so we are always like navigating the reality of, of the loss. And I, I keep thinking about this language of the movable feast, maybe because mm -hmm. I'm in New mm -hmm. Orleans, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the sort of the holidays that are the movable feast, but also that you, when you move through and you have just the sort of the remnants or the ephemera, and then you're trying to reconstitute some. So there's both like the excess of the things we just sure. sort of leave, but then there's also the remnants mm -hmm. right after, you know, the house gets turned over or mm -hmm. the thing, you know, the basement is flooded or the, and you try to rebuild something, right? Which is, I don't know, what is that? Maybe we can talk about what, what, is, what that feels like to do or what is that, how does, you know? The disparate? You yeah, mean we're trying to make of... sense of what has fallen. Right. How do you make, or how do you reconstitute or do you not even try to reconstitute? Because, you know, and I, I'll just, divulge that I have said that I read the yellow house as the house, right? It's mm -hmm. you've built an architecture of memory mm -hmm. in that book, mm -hmm. right? But it's also, it's also an architecture of loss that we make, right? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a, maybe it's a boat that I can get in in order oh, to explore oh, a former yeah. place, which maybe South to America is that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it can never be the thing. It can't, no. But it has a kind of pathway to understanding in it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think maybe that's what the writing tries to do, right? Is, is, is take all of these pieces. And in my case, because no one found this particular address to have significance. Mm -hmm. um, well, no one is not accurate, because obviously many people did. But, but because it wasn't in the official records, the work itself of me looking after the mm -hmm. papers and looking after the history and collecting the hundreds of oral histories, many of which I've never even listened to, yeah. were about that, those disparate parts. It was just a witnessing, a looking to, an acknowledgement of. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and, that, and I think 
I feel that also in South to America when you talk about art as archive, when you talk about what the body knows, what the self knows, what ge genealogy can't tell us. Yeah. There is a way that you're building a kind of archive of self. Mm -hmm. And I hope, and I mean, it, for me, it, the hope is that it becomes an invitation for everyone to feel, you know. I, I get so frustrated. Oh, this is probably impolitic to say. But I, I get frustrated um, when we talk about genealogy and the story is always, well, the, you know, after, before 1870, when black people can't trace the names of ancestors by and large, and it's sort of that that is the, this disaster is not to be recorded. And of course, many civilizations over the course of human history don't, don't record their stories in that way of, name, of birth dates and death dates and places born and name, that there are other ways to record our stories and our pasts and where we come from and, and, and and that actually the experimentation with that mm. is a virtue to think about, okay, then how do I tell my story? Sure. Where is my genealogy? It, it doesn't necessarily have to be bloodline, right? It doesn't right. have, right? And, but then that also messes with the idea of uh, beginnings. Right, yes. Or the idea of the origin story. story. Yeah. So then what to do with that? Right. Right, well, because I don't believe necessarily in origins, I do believe in beginnings. Beginnings are, right. are chosen. Right. We just decide to begin somewhere. And where we begin is a reflection of our priorities and our values. So I've been thinking a lot recently about, um, about you know, um, Virginia grave sites where periwinkle, there you see these clusters of periwinkle flowers because that's mm -hmm. where enslaved people would bury, right? And there are no headstones, but you know that there are ancestors under that soil, mm -hmm. right? That those types of, you know, and that's a different kind of attention. Sure, sure. Right, that we should be trying to, I don't know, I think that we, we, try, to, we try to tend to, yeah. yeah. So can I ask you a question about you having this extraordinary body of work and how you map yourself among these different works. What, what happens to you mm. um, when you move from one thing to the other? How do you know that something new is beginning and how do you know that something is stopping? And do you ever call back something the way Julie Moretu did? Yes, I have pulled things. But I also, I call back in that I will say, at times I've written things where I say, you know, I don't think that way anymore, mm -hmm. right? I think it's okay, you know, because this is a, we're, we're in process. Um, but sometimes I change my mind on something mm -hmm. I thought in the past. Um, I, I really struggle with this kind of question because it's always beginning and always ending and it's always repeating. So I'll look at an email that I wrote. I, oh, you know, I don't know, I think it was two, I can't remember what year it was, but I, I just pulled up an email um, to myself that I wrote about hearing Ed Weege um, with these, Ed Donticott with these formulations about the South. Mm. And I, you know, this was, I don't know, I think over 10 years ago. I wasn't yet working on South to America, but obviously what she said stuck with me. And I was like, oh, of course. And this is part of why I had the engagement with Haiti and the way that I did. And the, you know, that mm -hmm. there's, I think when you live, a wildness mm -hmm. of imagination and intellect and passionate and you're trying to like, so I, mean, I want to like, I mean, this is a part of why we have sort of a, a resonance of like wanting to, you know, look at art and listen to music and discover new things that then it's always sort of um, bubbling underneath the surface. Right, right. And, it, and so when the, pro when, the, when the product, when, when the artifact emerges, it's actually the completion of an exercise. Mm -hmm. I think of it even more as it's like an exercise and a performance, right? Sure. And that you're like, sure. right? I mean, it's, a, yeah. you, you know, the discipline of, 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 of doing the thing. Is that how the, do you? The, the actual work, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, you... the labor of that. I mean, it's funny because I just reread Those Bones Are Not My Child by Tony Cade Bambara. And her acknowledgments alone, mm -hmm are a kind of topography, really, having to do with all the people who said things to her. She really remakes how we think about 
archive, how yes. we think about contribution, how we think about what it means to create something. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in her very famous now uh, epigraph, she yes. says, you know, thanks to my mom who, when she saw me in a spell of concentration, mopped around me, mopped the floor around me, right? I mean, that's sort of as powerful as it gets. Exactly. And in that book, which is a tome, everyone should go out and, and read that, um, and all of the rest of her work too, we see this way that she has put all of these voices and all of these attentions in a way in the book. Yeah. And, that, and I think that process is its own form of archive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she has a fabulous letter in the Morrison a gorgeous, yeah. uh, exhibit. And they were great friends, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you about, um, about the spatial, which I always ask you about, Yeah. and your curation of space as part of the process? As Is part, that of, the as part of your writing work process, yeah. right, the work process? Well, it's funny because I do do a form of excavation yes. before I can work. Everything mm -hmm. has to be, I was going down a wrong path for most of last year. <laughs> was, it, was it wrong? It wasn't wrong. It was not it was the a path detour. I needed to be on. Okay. I wasn't even lost. It, okay. it simply was it just went, off just kilter. Went. Okay. But, but it was okay mm -hmm. because I learned things on that path. But then after I realized the path I actually needed to be on, there was this big sort of exorcism of my workspace and I had to put all these old things away and I had to clear all of my surfaces and I had to label everything. And mm -hmm. there, that's a kind of excavation. And then I think about what I have already that's part of the thing I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then there's a lot of going through that and uncovering what's there. And I think that attention, that, that importance that I'm giving vis-a-vis -vis my attention is a huge part of my, my process. Mm -hmm. So less the space in this particular work yeah. and more of the attention I'm giving. Um, it's this, this thing that I'm working on now is so much more physical in a sense. Mm -hmm. it, it requires something different of me you know, than, than this book that was so obsessed with this spot of earth. Yeah. Um, what about you? I keep, this keeps happening. I'm so enchanted by what the person I'm listening to is saying. I've, <laughs> what about me in terms of space? Space, yeah, what happens? What's your, do you have any rituals? Mm, not really. I mean, I just, you know, my ritual is that, that I, I, I like to sit down and actually put you know, fingers to keyboard or pen to paper. Um, but I don't have, I have no sort of like incantatory rituals. I mean, I get rid of things. Like I sort of, you know, I, I, I print things out, I read through them, I give them, you know, we, I have sort of processes. I, I throw away a lot of pages. Mm. I start over a lot. Mm. I do endless, seemingly en endless uh, outlines because mm. architecture mm. is so important to me. Um, but I, but there's a piece that you said before earlier that about what, what, this conversation we had about originality that I think is sort of, I mean, it's part of the, like the, I don't know, the, the keystone or whatever the word is, um, the cornerstone is, okay, so I'm going to go through some, so there's a, so there's this thing that, that I read that Ntosake Shange said about, um, no, no, that Nikki Giovanni said it about Ntozake Shange. I'll get to the point. It's going to take a few steps. So she says, um, you know, people thought that when Ntozake wrote for Colored Girls that it was actually, these things happened to her. And they were like, oh, so sad this happened to you, right? Mm -hmm. She like, it didn't happen. To, it didn't, it was, didn't happen to her. She was doing creative work. The point is that it happened, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that piece. And then I think about how, you know, when Toni Morrison tells the story about when she first encountered Gail Jones writing, she's like, oh my God, she's transformed black women's writing. She's broken through something that nobody else could do before. And this was repeated. But what would happen is that, so when she and uh, Maya Angelou and 
James Baldwin, all of them write about Gail Jones, they would re almost rewrite the story. Mm. So they would tell the same story with their language. Mm. And so there's something about that moving bits around or throwing out pages or re it's actually, that's the original part. So if the stories right. are, the story is true, so that means that it happened before and probably has been sure. told before, but we're actually trying to figure out well, what, what, are the, what are the pieces that I bring Sure. What's the arrangement? What's the quilt um, that I'm bringing that actually allows it to have a new life? So I think that's like the moving pieces around. Right. I mean, that, but that is essentially style, right? That's point, style, that's yes. That's point of view. Yes. That's, that's that inner thing you cultivate. Yes. And style is so important to black people. Right. I mean, I mean it we should be important to, to everybody. Yes. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> We like style. But this style is substantive, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because when you say, when we talk about style, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think about sound, I immediately think about the letters between Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray. Oh, yes. You know, I used to teach them mm -hmm. uh, just as pieces of writing because the cadence, the rhythm, the way they hopped around, the, the references, it, it was, and it is, remains, yeah. a brilliant example of style, yes. of formation. Yes, people trained in Alabama at Tuskegee Institute, now University, yeah, right. I just had to say one more. <laughs> Sorry, I that's come from a Tuskegee though. family. That's, okay. <laughs> that's yeah. true though. Yeah. But it's yeah. part of, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that they could, and, and, and they had such distinctive voices and talked so often about similar things mm -hmm. that you see that, yeah. Could yeah. you talk a little bit, since we're on the subject of Albert Murray. Yes. About South to a Very Old Place. No, oh, yeah. Um, because that is, I mean, you say it outright at some point oh, in the book, right? Yeah, my direct that, influence. That is, so can you talk a little bit about that work in particular, thinking about all the things we just talked about and then the work you made? Yes. Well, so one, I love that that, that book, um, <laughs> I actually want to add, I, part, okay, so it, the book <laughs> is written in, in large part in Harlem mm -hmm. from Lennox Terrace. Yes. And, the, and he looks out into the street of Harlem to see his south in part, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's interesting mm -hmm. in and of itself. And you are one of the few people I've talked to in, just in, in your description of Harlem where the resonance is so direct mm -hmm. to how you talk about it. Anyway, so that, there's that. Um, but Murray is, for me, um, uh, an incredible, incredibly important influence as someone who moved through the geography of the South with a kind of um, iconoclasm Mm. A refusal to choose between the intellectual, the aesthetic, the emotional, uh, uh, an unabashed claiming of the country as his own, mm -hmm. and also a, a refusal to avoid the reality of the violence mm -hmm. uh, that took place and takes place here. Right? Mm -hmm. So that book, and, and Murray and I have very different political perspectives. Mm -hmm. Murray is like a sort of deeply, was a deeply patriotic figure, did not think that black people in the United States had much to do with black people in other parts of the mm -hmm. world. I mean, I look, think very differently, but, um, but, but just stunning and, and such a, so deeply concerned with the level of the form, the sentence. Um, and I mean, I guess the, the last thing I'll say um, about him, he was, and this is, goes back to the question of style, he's a master of the second person. Mm -hmm. So everything was you. He talked about you, yeah. and he meant him. Right. And so he, he claimed space, mm -hmm. the, the kind of, a, a kind of, the kind of, and it, 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 it had an ethical sensibility, you know, there was an ethical weight behind it. My interiority is actually relevant for the central story of this yes. nation. Yes, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things, I don't know, one of the earliest things that I said to you about the Yellow House is that the ethics are so, the ethics are so important in the text, even the way that, and in, in 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 it's sort of another side of it, but that you, 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 
had a, have this unbelievable respect for the boundaries of the other person. Mm -hmm. And you treat beloved, beloved people with a kind of respect that is actually, I think, frankly, relatively unprecedented, mm. right? You don't, you, you don't colonize the interiors mm -hmm. of the people you love. Well, the, the, you know, thank you. Um, that's, I'll tell my brother, Carl, who I left literally cutting the grass when I, when I <laughs> left home. Um, he, I, thinking about all of these human beings and, and the people I respect and admire, the interior part, that's, that's it for me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think from Murray, I learned a lot precisely based on what you said mm -hmm. about that interior self, the second person, the first person, mm -hmm. um, that one could chart in a way interiority, yeah. the way you would chart a walk to the grocery store, that, that it had that same texture and that it was tactile mm -hmm. in a way. Um, it's a different form of learning. Yeah. And, you know, I love also the way that that allows him this ghostliness in the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are these ghostly moments in your work, Joe. It's like, oh, yeah. oh girl. There's always ghosts. Um, you know? <laughs> there, I mean, but you know, it's like when Morrison says, she's like, before I was writing novels, I didn't believe that like ghosts spoke to us and walked among us, and then I sure. started. I yeah. mean, I, there, I mean, we're here. <laughs> We this do, is, yes. We, we live amongst, mm -hmm. yeah. And whatever, what that means is sort of almost irrelevant, right? Sure. Whether that means a sort of, sort of literal spectral presence or the ways in which we're grappling with the past or the ways, the anxieties that appear in our dreams. or It doesn't, mm -hmm. I don't know that the form really matters, but to acknowledge that they're, Sure. They're here and with us. Yeah. I mean, that, that's sort of what Salt Eaters does from beginning to end, right? Is, is sort of hearken to the selves that yeah. have nothing to do with this sort of intellectual, logical way that we have of siloing ourselves. Selves, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we should open it up for questions. We'll keep talking. There's mics for you to, you know, come to ask questions if you have them, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more until... Oh, here we go. All right. It's hard to see. Yeah, I can't see. We can't see your face, so, but it's okay. It's okay. Hi, hi, Sarah and Amani. I'm fascinated about love, both from the text in Southern books and those written by Southern authors. And when I think of Morrison, love is the through line most resonant for me. So thank you for grounding your conversation there. Please speak or comment on how the joys and or discomforts of love manifest in the process of your writing? Mm. Lord. That's a beautiful question. Great question, Imani. <laughs> um, so I really, I will say, I mean, this maybe just reflect where I am at this moment. And I'll say that, you know, for me, the process, writing is, is a piece of living. And so it's, I don't even know that it's altogether different from the walk to the grocery store or the, you know, the, or the whatever, the running the bath water. I mean, this is part of the fabric of living. And as time goes on, the more I'm coming to a kind of what I think of as, a, as an emotional maturity and realizing that tragedy is actually integral to the day to day of life tragedy, grief, heartbreak. And so my, and, and not, and it, it runs counter to the way that we tend to think, particularly in the United States, of the way that we live, right? So the aspiration is that we move through time and we're trying to build things in our life so that we have a kind of white picket fence existence, right? Even if it's not a conventional sort, right? That we have, we achieve happiness, right? And I don't think happiness is something that one achieves. I think it's something that one, the joy is with something that one lives in the midst of the difficulty of living. And so the joy then becomes a kind of incorporated 
into the day-to-day -day of living. It's in, you know, it's in our dancing, it's in our laughing, it's in, the, you know, it's in the taste of the food, it's in the fellowship, it's in the hugs, it's in all those sorts of things. And so to try to animate the writing with that sensibility, not just depicting it, but actually that it can have moments of joy, right? That it, that it is, that there's a delight in putting together the sentence, even when what the sentence is, is doing is actually telling a terrible truth. I mean, there's something about, for me, I don't know, these mo when you have these moments of intense grief sometimes and you're like weeping and then somebody says something funny and it's like the funniest thing ever and, you're la and the laughter just, I mean, it just sort of opens you back up. I, that's the thing that I'm, I think that's the, the kind of joy that I want to access and communicate and allow to have a kind of resonance with the reader. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's great. I love it. I think you, I, you know, I want to say one thing, though, yeah. to add on to what you said. Um, and I think for me, I, I find enormous pleasure in question asking. Yes, you do. <laughs> she says. She can ask some questions, let me tell you. <laughs> well, but why did you think that? And then what happened after you? Right, I, I think that is for me yes. a, a very specific way of training my attention on someone. It's beautiful. And, and I think I was raised with people training their attentions on me. Yeah. And, and I think of that as what love is. Mm. And so in whatever I make, which whatever, right? I mean, who knows? It, there is some element of the questions, the iterations of the question becoming a form of love. Yes, oh, I love that. That's so true. Maybe another Hi, um, I'm Marissa Nathan Gerson. I teach here at Tulane and my class is here. Bachelor Nation 101 is listening right now. Um, I wanted to check in because I've met both of you and I love you both a lot and your work and I, went yesterday for the first time to the Whitney Plantation and a lot of what you're talking about in terms of how they represent loss and how they represent names that you can't give the full name to came up and looking at just the way they weave together a story of horror to make it so someone can hear it in the present. And I guess I had some questions for both of you about how you, there is like a thread I see in the way in where your selfhood is placed in your history and the way that you tell your books and your stories that like you, you are there, and I'm kind of curious if you could talk more about that on like a gender and race spectrum in the U.S., like how that's interrupting a tradition of history telling, and just talk mm -hmm. a little more about just the vital importance of putting yourself in the center of the story, even though you're telling a collective. Mom? <laughs> center of a story. Well, it's interesting. Hi, Melissa. Um, I, as a person who was actually trained in journalism, yeah, um, it took me maybe three years <laughs> to actually write in the first person. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was very hard for me to do. Um, and I think it, it then felt revolutionary, right? Because um, the family is a great example of the collective. The, the collective in many sort of spheres. And, I, you know, history, we could have a whole talk about history and what is made of history and what we actually call history yeah. uh, in America. But, but I do think that as a kind of cartographer, which is what I think all writers actually are, mm. there is a way of placing yourself, which is constitutionally vital to the thing you're making because it's connected to style, it's connected to where you come from, it's connected to beginnings, it's connected mm -hmm. to origins, it's connected to um, archives, it's connected to how we make uh, different selves as we try to survive life. Um, and so, I don't know that I have any more direct answer mm -hmm. to that question, but, but I think the, I don't actually think of myself 
as someone who is relative to another, historically speaking. I, I think of all the people around me as vitally important. Mm. So I'm not writing to make them important. They, they already are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so there are, of course, many, many people doing this. The problem is they can't find a publisher. <laughs> so, so, you know, th this is, that's how I think of it. Yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, I think, it, in it, for me, it resonates with their people who, who ask, well, why did you write South to America Now? And I said, it took that long for someone to be willing to allow me to write this book. Sure. I'd have written it 20 years ago right. if someone would have allowed me to do it, a publisher would have. But I think in the other side of it, right, so for, um, in terms for your, in terms of training of, as a journalist, for me, being trained as a scholar, there is a kind of imperiousness. I often talk about the kind of the notion of the imperial scholar, right? Who one writes to argument and also uh, takes the position of authority. And for me, part of the process of being in the first person is actually admitting a kind of fallibility, um, a kind of vulnerability that actually functions as an invitation. Um, and it's a, it's a sincere invitation. I'm trying to discover some things that I actually can't, am acknowledging that I cannot puzzle through completely individually, but I want someone to trust me enough to be willing to walk along the road with me, perhaps agree, perhaps disagree, but then actually then be interested in us sort of traveling further together, right? Which is, um, which is really, uh, on a certain level, always the point, right? In the context of the scholarly, it's the scholarly conversation, right? It's sort of going back and forth and trying to get, we're, we're collecting information and we have arguments. So it's an, it's, a, it's an aesthetic choice, but it's actually, I think, has a kind of transparency that felt, uh, that felt necessary when I was talking about something that was so intimate. Mm. Yeah, yeah sense of home, thank, thank you. you. I loved all those moments. I loved your Thank your you. personal narrative points. I appreciate. Yeah, yeah I, I truly did. We have another. Oh, <laughs> hey there. Hey. Um, I'm going to ask what is an extremely personal, selfish, but also hopefully helpful um, question for the rest of the crowd. So, um, as someone who is doing this work on what I like to call the work that you all are doing is the Black Southern Renaissance. Like this idea of Black Southern agency, getting away from Southerness as completely whiteness. Yeah. And as you were saying, to do this work, um, the archeology span of genealogy, being an architect of disparate things that we know are there, that we feel are there, we can see them, we can touch them. Like I told someone yesterday, like, oh, this wonderful food that we're eating in New Orleans, you know, that came from black women, you know, so. Um, but as a Southerner, as a Southern woman, mm -hmm. who is an intellectual, who is an artist, who is doing this work, it's so frustrating because like you said, um, you bump against this idea of like, oh, you're a black Southerner, you can read, you can write, you can think. And then it's also this idea of like, oh, no, 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 you're black Southerners, you know, y'all are still like pseudo enslaved people, so you need someone to explain to you your existence, you know, so. Bumping against all of that and still doing the work, it is still really frustrating because, like you said, A, finding publishers, B, and then even cons you know, convincing people that this work is even important. Mm -hmm. So my question is, like I said, it's personal. Like, how do, what's the push through, mm -hmm. right? You know, how can someone like me who is trying to do this work <laughs> but is still very frustrated with, like, this idea of even doing work on black Southern agency, how do you push through? Like what spirits, cause I, I, cause I hear mm -hmm. the ancestral strain, I hear the spiritual strain in your work. So what's the push through? Mm. Are you looking at me? Yes, I am. Through? I will say this. So I think it was the first issue of Oxford American. I may be wrong, but I had it. My mother probably threw it away. Mm -hmm. She throws away my old stuff. But it asked this question, it had an essay, why does, Southern why does Southern literature mean white? And I remember reading the essay and saying to myself, I want to be part of that no longer being the case, right? It was many years before I wrote, wrote creatively. And 
my answer is in part that it's to un there's two sort of sets of building blocks that I think to think about. One is that the building blocks we pursue as writers need, have to be small, mm. right? The small venue, the small public, that we, that, that there's a way in which, because we read these stories, especially on the age of so social media, these stratospheric rise, and people pretend that everybody, ha nobody, I mean, maybe there's three people in the world. But most people are, plodding along and you build relationships and community and you're doing, you actually, you're doing the work. Then the other thing is genealogy, because I think you're absolutely right about it. I was in a, in a taxi the other day and they, in Philadelphia where I live and the driver said, you know, he, he's, you know, I can't go down to Alabama. And I was like, you live in Philadelphia. Like, you know, like I'm scared to go down there. Where do you live? Right. Um, and I think, but then I think, but if we tell the story of black writing, it's a Southern story over, it's also Midwestern, but it's overwhelmingly a Southern story. We, the tradition actually emerged. So if you tell the story, you, it becomes undeniable. The institutions that actually created, the, they're in the South, right? The intellectual tradition, right? And so I think we have to actually tell the story to the people we encounter. This is actually the story. It starts here. It comes here, was sustained here, mm -hmm. right? Who can you, I mean, the tradition. It's the grounds for the tradition. That's true. And, and also, and I, I think she covered that part, yeah. but going to tradition, there is something about the dailiness. Just you and your work. Mm. That dailiness, that doesn't matter about awards, doesn't matter about publishers, no one has your hands tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. It's just the dailiness of showing up. Before I was an, a book writer, I was running nonprofit organizations all over the globe. And, and I wrote at 4 a.m. every day before my crazy job. And it was the way that awesome. I gave myself something. So that and your dailiness. And on that note, thank y'all. Thank you.